All right, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is our presentation on maximizing cannabis business potential with loyalty, staffing, and innovation. I'm Paul Cambio. I do the legal work for Flower Expo. I'm a, a California attorney. I represent a Nevada corporation, and we do shows in Michigan and Massachusetts. So we're all over the place. A lot of regulation, and I'd like our a panel to introduce themselves and tell us what they do in the cannabis industry. Hey, my name is Steve Ripperip. And I'm the CEO and founder of Tact Firm. We are a retention agency for dispensaries, and we work with over uh, 30 stores in five states. And just in July alone, we were able to add about $261,000 to dispensaries in brand new revenue. I'm Lisa Williams. I am founder and CEO of the Toke Agency, and we help cannabis dispensaries increase their bottom line and their profit margin without relying on discounts, so heavily on discounts. And we are also certified with Alpine IQ and Spring Big, so we utilize your loyalty program to create that overall brand experience. Uh, hello, my name is John Paul. I am the founder of Hemp Temps. We are a staffing agency for the industry. <clears throat> and. Uh, we have an application that uh, we're showcasing here at Michigan because we're expanding into the Michigan market. And we've been around for 11 years. We've trained and placed over 20,000 people in the industry. Um, we have an education platform uh, built into our application. It's called Hemp Temps University. On the temp side, on the employee side, employees can enjoy 23 free compliance courses that if, if they don't have a foundation in the cannabis or marijuana industry, they can go and get that and have an understanding before we start placing them. They also have to take a one hour WPS training course, which is also free. That is a department of uh, the EPA, Department of Agriculture, um, OSHA came together to make uh, safety for all agricultural workers. So it teaches people how to be around products that have exposure to pesticides. So anybody on the employee side have to take all those courses before they go out and grab jobs through our platform. It's very similar to other gig economy platforms where once you're in, you can grab those jobs. Um, they also have to go through a background check. So we have a badging system. They have to pass a pretty robust background check system. So uh, it's good for both sides to have all these upfront uh, processes to come in and then on uh, the, the customer side, they can come in very similar to like a Lyft or an Uber, go on, post the jobs, uh, how many people they need, say they have big spikes in labor needs, whether it's a big dispensary event, packaging, harvesting, labeling, you name it. The manufacturing side is a big part of our business. They can go on there, put those jobs up, they will get grabbed by the qualified uh, employees and uh, they'll be able to service that big spike in labor through our application so we're really excited to be working in the Michigan market we're really happy to be here at the flower expo and yeah that's us we just had a real quick follow-up for you do you uh, staff in all areas of the cannabis industry or just the retail side no that's a great question so we primarily focus on what you would probably call entry-level roles so uh, trimmers bud tenders harvesters uh, on the extraction side, not necessarily the extractor themselves, but an extractor assistant, somebody that's gramming out or uh, like helping in that process, you know. So typically anything up to helping in the manufacturing process. On the grow side, a lot of grower assistants, not necessarily head grower, but grower assistants uh, help around. A, a, a big part of what we do is uh, there's opportunity costs in this industry, especially when you're changing out rooms. So there's about three major, before you change out a room, there's about three major um, events where you're de-leafing or doing work around the room that have big spikes in labor. And then the biggest one is obviously at the end when you harvest, changing out those rooms. That's a lot of work. So you could have maybe two people run that room for five days, cleaning it up and getting it work, or you can get 10 people in there and get that room switched out within 24 hours. And as anybody who's an experienced cultivator producing for multi stores and supply chain, that's a big deal. Those five days make a huge difference in uh, opportunity costs. So, excellent. You can hang on to the mic. Oh, okay. um, so, 
what are some of the biggest mistakes you see uh, in the cannabis uh, employers and uh, trying to retain clients and staff? So I would say this goes this goes for all industry really, but it, it's really um, taking the time, and this is for all roles, right? Upper management doesn't matter what the role is. Um, taking the time to really think out the role and write out the scope of work and the responsibilities of that job. I think that there's a lot of people in all industries that have uncertainty around what they really do at their company, especially for smaller businesses because you know, you're lean and mean, everybody's wearing many hats, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that if somebody's coming on board and they are gonna be wearing many hats, they should first be told that, right? Not be hired for one thing and then kind of like bait and switched, right? They should be like, hey look, we're lean and mean, we have multiple roles here we're trying to fill with this admin role or whatever the role is and be very clear with the employee and also it's important for the employer to know that because they have a clear idea of KPIs, expectations of that role. Of that role. So I would say that's, that's a big deal in all employment but spe especially in this industry on a lot of companies are running lean and mean, you know, 280E, we've got low margins on a lot of product, and a lot of times people wear many roles, and that's just the way our country was built. So just being really clear about that, I would say expectations, and then also compensating them correctly. So you see the same people have the same turnover over and over and over, it's because they're either not paying them well, or there's a bad culture. So those are kind of maybe the three bullet points, I would say culture, compensation, and the biggest one, clear expectations of the role. Excellent. Can you pass the mic? So we want to create an overall brand experience. And in order to create an overall brand experience, your, your outside needs to look like your inside. And so when your bud tenders and or your staff, when you have high turnover, when you have a lot of people coming in and out, um, that could be challenging in a dispensary, but what you really need is your bud tenders and the people who are on the front lines to be trained effectively and efficiently to make sure that they're getting everybody signed up for a loyalty program to get them to follow you on social media to create that overall brand experience so that when we um, deploy an email or a text or um, you drop a new product or, or a new deal or something like that, they are getting all that information. But if the bud tenders or the frontline staff is not encouraging uh, the, the customers to sign up for that loyalty program and to get those texts and emails, then you're not able to communicate and you don't, you're not able to read the data, you're not able to communicate, you're not able to know who your customers are and understand their buyer behavior. All right, so we know in retail, cash is king, but your list is the queen, right? Your list is phone numbers and emails, just like Lisa was talking about. That's your loyalty members, people that you can message. So here's a really shocking statistic. Out of all the customers in a dispensary, 40 to 60% only come in once and never come back again. A lot of times, uh, it's very consistent across all stores in all states. 40 to 60% only come in once and never back again. You know, over 80% of those first-time shoppers, they leave without giving you an email. So you have to build that list. Get those emails, get those phone numbers, because then you can remarket to them, right? Use platforms such as Alpine IQ, Spring Big, Happy Cabbage, where you can send them text messages, send them emails based on their product habits, what they buy, product categories, when they buy. There's so many ways to communicate back to them. So you retain customers, they're your million dollar customers. You know, whether a store does $100,000 a month or a million dollars a month, those loyal returning customers are gonna provide a substantial amount of money to that store, right? And it makes all the difference between stores that spiral lower and lower every month to the stores that thrive month after month. Build the list and then you can monetize and find ways to extract way more revenue from them. So with all this said, right, Building the list is important, getting them to sign up. And there's at least five touch points at the dispensary where you can get them to sign up at. So when they walk in at reception, the receptionist should be asking them, hey, you know, welcome, are you signed up for a loyalty program? Or are you signed up, opted in for messaging? They can also verify that on the systems in the POS or the CRM. Uh, if there's a big wait, 
you can have a poster up in the waiting room as well with the QR code. It explains the benefits of joining the loyalty program, why you want to be opted in. Uh, other touch points are when a bud tender gets paired with that customer. They can tell them about the benefits of being opted in. Again, ask them if they're opted in, if they're a loyalty member. When they're checking them out, they could say, hey, you know, if you were signed up, you would get information on these deals that you were a part of, uh, new product drops, educational content. And then as they leave, if they're still not signed up, drop a card in their to-go bag with a QR code that explains the, the benefits again. So when they go home, open up that bag, and they're consuming, they can see that. So their entire experience within the store, you should be trying to, as hard as possible, to get that phone number or email. A lot of times, you might have to incentivize them, give them $5 off, $10 off, because that is a small price to pay for them to come back again and to retain them. Very small price to pay. So build that list. Again, the list is the queen. Excellent. How important is uh, the employee in implementing that process? Yeah, so one of our stores that we were working with, uh, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, actually, so they were, they were doing about 10 to 15 signups a week. That's not very many. And then what we did is we told them about these touch points. We created materials that they could have in store, poster, uh, something on the TV screen, uh, little flyers at the POS, to-go cards. We trained the bud tenders on the talking points of joining the loyalty program. They went from 10 to 15 a week to 70 to 90 a week. That's a huge impact now to their list. After a couple months, they now have hundreds and hundreds of more customers that we can now retarget and remessage. Again, that 40 to 60% that come in and shop once, you have no possible way to bring them back in unless you capture their email. To echo what Steve just said, we help our customers create all of those touch points, whether it's a QR code, whether it is getting on um, a Zoom call with the managers to understand what needs to be reiterated to the bud tenders and creating material, whether it's a poster or posting on social media and getting them to follow you on social. And you could use the, the loyalty program and your social media program as a two-prong ap approach. So you get your bud tenders and all the touch points that Steve just mentioned to get your customers to sign up to your loyalty. So you capture their, their text and their email information, their phone number and their email information. And then you could also send out messages to say, hey, you earn loyalty points by following us on social media and or he, uh, on social media, you could highlight your loyalty program. So, so you could use that two-prong approach to kind of cycle your, your message wherever your customers are sitting and wherever you, they are, wherever touch point they are, whether it's walking in the store, whether they're already on your loyalty program, or if it's in social media. Yeah, and I think you touched on it a little bit earlier about uh, paying the employees enough uh, the culture there, but employee retention. Um, can you give people more advice on that? And do these employees need to be sophisticated to be able to pick up this stuff, or can a basic entry level employee kind of grasp it? So you're at, you're asking about employee retention um, at the entry level position. Where in the uh, I mean. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all those same things, right? It's like the culture, it's one personality isn't necessarily going to fit in every single location. You go to all these different dispensaries and grows and the culture is completely different. You know, they might look the same, but they're not. There's very different cultures from everything down to like where they go eat lunch, how they eat lunch, do they eat it inside, do they go out for lunch, do they, what do they do together? You know, do they like to go do sports? Do they like to go watch, listen, listening to music in a grow room? You'd be surprised how that can change the culture quick. You know, like, what type of, you're listening to the same music all day. If you can't take that music, like, that's, who's in charge of that radio? Little things like that. I mean, it's silly, but, you know, the culture is a big deal. And it doesn't mean it's a bad culture always. It just means it's not a culture fit. So I would say vetting in, on the front end to make sure there's a cultural fit is is good. And, you know, that's hard to do, too, because of, Everybody wants the job, right? So they're going to conform to try to get the job most of the time. They want to get paid. But I think if you have really good qualifying questions, there's a great book out there. Uh, it's called The Ideal Team Player. Uh, if you haven't picked that up, it's got a really good questions you can go and ask for your culture. 
And it almost puts an inevitable way for a person to fire themselves from the interview um, for you know your cultural beliefs and uh, whether they're really a team player because that's what we're talking about, right? Building teams and um, not everybody is meant to be on a team. And unfortunately in cannabis, specifically on the horticulture side, there's a lot of people in power with, that are really good with plants that aren't great with people. And knowing that within your organization is great because, hey, stick this person with plants, but don't make them also in charge of running people. Those are two different roles, right? Some people are good at both, and that's great. You got a, you got a, you got a, a rock star, right? Like, oh, you found someone's great with people, and like uh, some might call that a unicorn, or like you know, it's like a programmer that also tells locker room jokes, right? Like, those aren't the everyday people, but knowing people, people's roles and how they affect the culture is a big deal. Paying them for the role, the, the right rates, maybe above to keep them around. If they have talent, they're probably getting recruited. Sorry, we're a recruitment agency. You know, we do look for talent as well. But um, does that answer the question or you want to elaborate yeah, a little absolutely. more on that? Absolutely. Okay. And, how, and how important is retention of employees to the cannabis, to a cannabis business? I would say, day? yeah, I mean, I would say it really depends on the role, right? If it's uh, a very uh, important role to the dispensary, the extraction lab, the, the facility, the manufacturing, the outdoor, and they're a pivotal part of the organization, retention is a major deal. And you better be paying attention to those people because the cost to, re to replace those people is a lot higher than you think. Um, so take the time and think, okay, have we sat down? Have we talked about the roles? Have we talked about their performance? Have we talked about their compensation? Obviously, inflation is playing a major role right now in the way that we spend our money. I don't know about you. Your groceries gone up in price. Mine have a lot, way higher than what the news is reporting. And um, that the wage hasn't necessarily followed that. And we're going to, I think in these next uh, 24 months, we're going to see some significant wage changes across the country because it's impossible to live off of pe what people were living on two years ago, you know? So I think the wage, scope of work, the culture fit, those are all big things. I think you can apply that to pretty much any company in the world, right? But cannabis is an interesting, you know, we, we add these filters of cannabis to, and there are some, some things that are very specific about our industry, but if you're on the horticulture side, you're farming, okay? Just be clear, you're farming in a cooler way. Your, your product is just more expensive than tomatoes or corn, and there's a lot more regulation. If you're on the lab side, you're just like any other lab that makes any sort of lab compliant product. If you're on the retail side, you're retail. You just have a little extra layer before you walk in and buy. And you know, um, I think that a lot of the rules that you should apply to those companies that have built good culture, good business practices, should take those and apply them to your company in cannabis because not everybody is. And if you do that, you will attract talent because people talk. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, employee uh, retention is not really geared to cannabis. It's any company that really has a good, you could mimic yeah, that. Yeah, I, I would say so. There's a lot of people, especially what, what, what we do, they, they get into the industries, frankly, for the wrong reasons. They think it's going to be like a Cheech and Chong or like a, a Pineapple Express, or, a, or maybe I'm not quoting the, yeah, Pineapple Express. Like they think they're going to be sitting around smoking weed all day. And that's not the case. Like you're busy, you're doing stuff. If you're, you're retail, you got lines, you got people, you got to be coherent. You need to talk about what you're doing. And they just think it's, they, they have a misconception of what it is. And that's a big reason why we have our, we have 23 courses they have to take, right? Like that vets out a lot of those people because in those courses they realize, oh wait, I'm like going to be working on real stuff here and being held accountable. And, you know, I think that's the big disconnect for a lot of people. And then you have the polar opposite where you have people that just understand their worth and they try to get their foot in the door in any way. Like we have molecular biologists come work for us as trimmers but they know that they can go get into the facility, shine, and get hired on, and then later on end up running that whole thing, right? So it's just a mindset thing, and um, cannabis just attracts a lot of, uh, unfortunately, um, people with bad work ethics as well. And I've heard it across all industries. The work ethic is really low in America right now. It's bad. We had a lot of stimulus checks go out. It really changed the the way that people value the dollar. And now look, the dollar, the dollar is opposite, right? So, but yeah, it's all industry, but cannabis has a little bit of layer with that, the stigma of 
you know, we're all stoners and yeah, we are all stoners about the right time, right? Like we smoke weed when we're responsibly, right? So excellent. Lisa, uh, can you tell us about the importance of a customer loyalty program to a cannabis retailer? Of course. <laughs> um, we we want to create a brand experience. And in order to create a brand experience, you every touch point that your customer comes in contact with your brand says something about your brand. So whether it's your website, whether it's social media, whether it's signing up for your loyalty program, uh, whether it's walking into your store and experiencing what it feels like to walk into your dispensary, you're creating a brand experience. And in order to keep your, keep your customers coming back time after time after time, they have to feel like they belong to what you're selling them. They belong to your culture. They belong to whatever that dispensary looks like, feels like, speaks like, sounds like. They have to feel like they belong. I'm going to use myself as an example. I am an Apple girl. I have a Mac. I have an iPhone. I use Apple products. I, I'm bought and sold into the culture, right? They, they've, they've captured me. And it's really hard for me to change to go to another system because it's all integrated and it's all intertwined and... I don't want to learn something else. And that's kind of how you treat your customers. You want them to come time after time after time so that the discounts down the street and the pricing down the street doesn't capture them. It doesn't do enough to get them to come in to your store, to your dispensary. And when you're hitting them with loyalty, you're segmenting them based on their buyer behavior, based on what they shop for, what they buy, what they purchase. And you're using those metrics to say, hey, hey, I see that you really like this flower and you could do some suggestive selling and offer them other options that are similar to that particular type of flower. Or you could say, you haven't, we haven't seen you in 30 days. Here's a coupon for a discount to come back and see us. Or tell a friend and you get bonus points. Or follow us on social and you get bo bonus points. And you're just creating that ever-ending loop of them coming back and once they start creating those bonus points and they could only use it at your store at your dispensary so then you've captured them and you know hopefully they're going to be a long-term customer and they're going to be brand advocates for you where they're going to start spreading the word and telling their friends and family all right if you work at a dispensary or if you own one or your marketer there listen up you might want to write this down I'm going to give you the exact steps and systems that we use to create a uh, retention engine that uh, creates those million dollar customers like I was mentioning earlier. So the first thing we do is we dive into the data. You have to look at uh, the key retention metrics. For example, some of those are what's your opt-in rate, like I was talking about earlier, what's your retention rate, repurchase rate, how many customers you have lost, and what's the potential for recovery. And then you just dive in, look for the opportunities where you can bring in the most revenue. The second thing we do is we start to recover those lost customers. So we target people that have not been in the store for over 60 days. Another shocking statistic, about 30 to 50% of your email list are people that have not been in the store in over 60 days. Huge. And so we get them to come in. You know, one of our stores here in Michigan, uh, just in the last two months, we recovered over $96,000 for them in brand new revenue. You know, again, there's big power in that. The third thing we do is we engage with that list through, again, those platforms like Alpine IQ, Spring Big, Happy Cabbage, like Lisa was talking about, give them recommendations on products, uh, send them messages based on how they purchase, what they purchase, and when they purchase. There's thousands of ways to segment your audience, and, but you have to look through the data and figure out what's going to be the best way where we can contact them and get the most revenue out of this. And then the fourth and final thing we do is we get first-time customers to return. Again, that 40 to 60% that haven't been in your store more than once, there's ways that we can get them to come back. And we want to hit at least five times. We have a loyalty metric, and we call them, you know, this is our loyalty, loyal customers. It's our loyalty rate. We look at customers that have shopped over five times in the last six months and have shopped in the last 30 days. And we look at that and say, okay, this is the best base of loyal customers that we can figure out. And then we can look at that and say, how many more customers do we need to bring in on top of that? 
That's your almost like for SaaS models, uh, monthly recurring revenue. You have a predictable amount coming in every month and you try to build on top of that. Well, we've built a model to figure out what is your basically monthly recurring revenue of, from loyal customers that are shopping very regularly, they have a pattern of shopping regularly. For example, a store that might do $400,000 a month in revenue, we found that to be around $150,000 to $200,000. That means you have that much of reliable revenue coming in. Everything on top of that is, is a gamble. Where do they come from? They come from your social media, your advertisements, uh, your presence at, in community events, sponsorships. There's a lot of ways, and they need to be tracked as well. So all that put together is how you create a retention engine that just grows and grows and compounds over time. For example, some other int really interesting statistics, uh, customers that we won back in March, for one of our stores, they won back around 100 customers, and they spent around, um, sorry, the 100 customers, $10,000, so about $100 each. Well, what happens when you give them 30 more days, 60 more days, 90, 120 days? We just got the data this past week for 150 days after we won them back. 76% of them have come in more than once, and they spent about $36,000. So that's three and a half times more than what they initially did in the beginning. So again, it's a compounding snowball effect. You do that every month for six months to a year. You've now added a considerable amount of revenue to the store, brand new revenue that didn't exist. And this system that I just talked about, that's what we did. Uh, so in the past four months since April, yeah, four months, we've recovered over 5,000 customers, actually almost 6,000, who spent about $631,000 in brand new revenue for these stores. Again, super powerful. It's a place that no one is looking at for retention. Everyone's looking at trying to gain new customers, which is insanely expensive. You, you do the math on that. Say you do weed maps ads every month, $220,000 you spend on that. I don't know how many customers it gets you, 100, 200 customers? Say 100. Say 200 customers, they spend 100 bucks. Okay, if we know that 60% of them might not shop there again, and you have even Keystone 50% margins, the $20,000 that you brought back in, you spent to, to make, well, 50% of that goes to margin, your cost, so you just lost $10,000, and then 60% of those people aren't gonna come back again, and so you bring that down, you just paid $20,000 to lose, uh, really is like 20, 30, 30 some thousand dollars. That's when stores, they realize they're on a decline, they're losing money. They have debts to pay back, they have payroll to make, overhead, and they're constantly losing money, and they don't know why. It's because they're not looking at their customer acquisition cost, and they're not looking at retaining and recovering their lost customers. So if you wanna make the biggest revenue impact in these stores, that's where it's at. Excellent. Um, do you have any suggestions on ways uh, retailers can streamline their businesses to change to the new conditions and kind of a race to the bottom of the price of cannabis? Yeah, and like I was just talking about, these, these metrics, these marketing metrics, they're critical to any business, whether you're in cannabis or not, retail or wholesale or B2B. It's what do you pay to acquire a customer? What is that customer worth over the long term? That's customer acquisition cost, CAC, and then their, their value over the long time. It's their lifetime value, LTV. What is that ratio, LTV to CAC? If it's positive, that means you put in a dollar and you got $2 back, great. But we know with margins, if you got $2 back, you're basically breaking even. And if we look at even further expenses, you're losing money. So it has to be far in excess. So if you put a dollar in to your marketing advertising system, you need to get at least $5 back, at least, right? Depending on where your num the rest of your numbers are at. And then take into the account that those customers are gonna end up leaving because you're not retaining them. So if we're able to retain them, then we have our cost to reacquire, our cost to recover those customers, and that increases their value over time. We just did a study with some of our stores, and just in a 30-day, 60-day time period, it was a 6.7 to one LTV to cost to reacquire them. That means if they spent $10 to win them back, those customers spent about $67, which you're positive on that. You take into margins account, but then you, again, take that over a long period of time, six months, three months, a year, that number goes higher and higher and higher. And so you're really getting some good value out of that. Again, a lot of these stores are not looking at these very simple, but key metrics. Cost to acquire a customer, lifetime value, then cost to retain or cost to recover them. And that's it. I'm gonna echo what, what Steve just said. 
if you are spending money to go after a new customer, it is about 60% more in cost than it is to market to your existing customers. And why not keep bringing those existing customers back and make them loyal customers and brand advocates and big time fans and followers so that they could be your marketing voice for you and they could echo what you're trying to share. And you're not spending marketing dollars on getting them to bring their fans, their family and friends into the store. So remarketing to your existing customers and using your loyalty program through Alpine IQ or Spring Big or Happy Cabbage to, to constantly hit them with their pain points. So you, you understand their shopping habits, you understand their buyer behaviors, you understand what they're purchasing, and you segment your list and you start targeting that list with different messages based on their buyer habits and their buyer behavior. And then you're saying, hey, you know, it's your birthday and we want to celebrate your birthday with you. So come see us. Or, hey, it's your one month anniversary since you first visited us. Come back again. And there's just so many ways to, to mix this up and keep them coming back and not trying to always capture a new customer. And then also not having to compete on discounts. You shouldn't have to discount your prices every single time because you know what that tells your customer that there's really no higher value for that price. It's the discounted price. So why not just make the discounted price your price? Why are you always discounting it? It's training your customers to understand that I don't need to buy this product at a higher price because it's always discounted. So we don't want to train them on, on discounts. We want to train them to come back time after time after time. Uh, the investment in training these employees almost streamlines the process in the long run because you don't have as much turnover. Is that kind of the deal? Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I mean, that's everywhere. I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Um, is there any other suggestions on streamlining uh, with respect to retaining employees and finding them? Oh, just employees? Or Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I thought we were going to talk about what they were talking about for a second. So I was like, um, I don't know. Have more conversations with your employees. Slow it down a little bit. Take a second. Take a breather. Um, it seems like if you train them well, there's going to be less turnover Well, for the employer. You know, yeah, it's, it's just different roles, right? So let's, we've been talking, this, this panel's a little partition with more retail, and we really deal with a lot of back of the house. So it's interesting to hear the different point of views because there's a lot of expertise on, on here that I'm, I'm absorbing, right? So I would say for front of house, hire, you know, hire them like for the last question. Uh, for this question... Um, for sales, right? Um, really, bud tenders are somewhat of salespeople, right? Would everybody agree with that? So if you're a medical salesperson, you're, the best way to sell is through qual qualified sales. So I'll talk about maybe training along the lines of bud tending, and I think that's that we, we can talk a little bit more about that. I don't think there's enough training on, there's all this effort on the manufacturing and marketing and uh, b2b sales side to create this packaging in it but there's not enough to teach the employees what's behind that product what was special about that product right because although after they leave we have all these great data points that we can get them back in there but if their experience there wasn't good none of that matters okay so that's where the training really comes into play and a lot of people aren't salespeople; they just don't have sales backgrounds they're nice and they want to help the customer. But I can't tell you how many dispensaries I've been in where I kind of wanted to be upsold. I wanted to know about what, was, what else was new. And they just kind of like quickly burned through me to get out the door. Um, so training's a big deal in that aspect, training them how to upsell respectfully, not over the top, not like pushing it down the customer's throat, right? Like, respectfully qualifying the customer if it's medical or retail and getting to know the customer a little bit more about what they like, whether it's terpene profile, it's price, uh, a color, 
a memory, something. There's always some sort of story behind somebody's favorite thing to consume, right? There's a feeling, it's like coffee, right? So um, I would say getting your employees trained on understanding the psychology behind sales could go a long way on the front on the front side. I think it'll, if you train them that, they'll always remember that for the rest of their life because it can be used across all types of things, including your personal life. You can use, you know, there's a lot of psychology involved with getting to know people in the sales process. So I would say that's a big part. And then um, another big part that I'd like to see is when dispensaries through the training process have their employees try their products. Because I can tell you, number one, when someone doesn't sell a product, it's because they've never tried it. It's like when you go to a restaurant and you ask the waiter or waitress, like, what's your favorite thing on the menu? And they say, I actually have never eaten anything on our menu. It's like, that's not a good sign. <laughs> like, what's wrong? Is the kitchen bad? Like, is the bathroom? What's, like, that's, that just makes so, when you go to a bud tender and they're not trained on the product, they don't really know. They're reading the label to get the facts. They're not on their point. They don't understand exactly what you're after. They're not really qualifying you and putting that qualified time. That's all part of training. So I would say that on the front side, because that's more of what we're talking about today uh, with the other two panelists, is let's get that training right and take a little extra time. You know, I've heard of dispensaries doing a whole week training and some like one day. That's up to you to decide the challenge to the role and what, and what you expect of that person. But when you don't get those sales or they're not trained on filling out the information at the point of sale, because point of sales are CRMs, right? They're only as good as the data the employee is putting in. So the employee's like so amped to get them out the door for whatever reason, whether it's to get back to their break or to get the line shorter, train them how to, train them how to handle that. Conflict resolution is another great one. You know, how to deal with conflicts, you know, you have discounts into play. You know, oh, I didn't get my discount or I already checked out, I got my discount. How to handle those situations, how to escalate those situations, how to de-escalate those situations, you know. That's the training that we're talking about and that's, that's my best answer for that, sorry. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, we have just about five minutes left and... Um, I generally like to ask the panel if uh, they were 15 years old, did they ever think they'd be making money in the cannabis industry? Uh, I, not 15, but 17, yes. I was, had already grown my own plants. Um, but legally was, in the cannabis industry? Yeah, yeah. I actually grew in my house, and my parents allowed me to grow weed in my closet. And they told me, we're going to let you grow weed in your closet, but it's only because you're learning science, right? Like, but if they come to our door and knock on the door, we're, we're not going to know anything about it, okay? And I'm like, all right, cool. So, but they didn't ever thought, they pretty much always tell me it never amount to anything. And um, I was like the nerd that read every hydroponic magazine, read every Rose, Ed Rosenthal, followed Mark Emery, ordered seeds from Canada. Like, I love cannabis. And I think for us specifically, we're founded by real industry growers, OGs. We have a construction side. We've built 600 facilities. Test us on that stuff, man. Like we know the plant, we know the industry. We come from, we're like that mix, right? From uh, black, uh, black market like to corporate. Team. When I walk in a room, uh, my staff usually say, oh, everybody be quiet, corporate came in, right? But we come from both sides. We, we, we're HR, so we have to be very specific with our words, right? But yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I, I was that kid that knew, I knew for sure I was going to be in cannabis for life. I have a little bit of a story and we have, it, we don't have enough time for me to tell it, but I'll give you a quick highlight. So I grew up in the 80s, war on drugs, and um, my boyfriend at the time when I was in college, I lived in a border town and he moved pounds across the border. And in order for me to make money as a poor, starving college student, I would help him distribute those pounds, and I'd get on an air, he'd buy a ticket, I'd get on an airplane, he'd check the bags, I'd get off the airplane, grab the bags, and meet him in a rental car. And um, did that for several times to, to make some money to pay for college. So if I look back at, <laughs> can you, I know, right? Like pushing pounds. <laughs> I, I guess we could call myself a legacy operator, even though I don't operate right now. <laughs> um, so 
fast forward to today and that fact that I'm in the cannabis industry, marketing for the cannabis industry legally, um, it blows my mind. Really, it does. I mean, I, I love telling that story. There's way more to it, but I love telling that story because it kind of ties into what I do now so perfectly. Never thought I would be working in the legal cannabis industry. Uh, I remember like 15 years ago in college, we would buy, I had no, had no idea what it cost. And so we're like, oh, let's get a gram. What's it cost? 20 bucks. Sure. Okay. No idea. We get it. I'm like, what are these leaves on here? What are these seeds? Can we grow anything from this? And I think my buddy actually gathered a bunch of seeds and, and tried to grow from that, but it didn't because he didn't know anything about how to grow. And then, you know, in college, it was just more of like a recreation, understanding uh, just the different effects that it gives you as a college kid. And then later on, when I got a little bit older, you know, more of an adult, young business owner, there's a lot of stress there. I couldn't sleep. I would, had this insane insomnia, so much uh, things keep me up at night. And I use it for sleep. And that helped out immensely. So I found a functional way to use it. And then, you know, when I got uh, started doing work in the industry, we weren't doing retention in the beginning. I was just helping out dispensaries and processors, cultivators, just a bunch of back end admin stuff. And through the course of just being really curious and discovery, I found different ways to, you know, create a business around it and help actually help these stores. But for each point along the way, I never thought that my sole focus would be cannabis. And that's all we do and all I do. And that every day I talk with different owners of cannabis dispensaries, uh, different types of operators, and we figure out how to uh, do business better, how to make more money in, in better ways, ethical ways, right? We don't work with companies that cross the line, and there's been some conflicts in the past where sometimes companies want you to do something that's against regulation, against compliance, and I'm not okay with doing that. And so the fact that we get to the privilege to work in the legal right, industry means we should also do our job to keep it going and not hurt it as much. We know a lot of the press going out there, things in Michigan, but also in every state with some of the loose compliance that people are following. And people are doing that because they want to make a buck. And when you have things like pesticides getting into uh, the products or other type of harmful things, you can tell who's in it for money and who's in it for the patient and the end consumer. And so the people that are really taking the effort to make the changes correctly, they know you know they have a good heart to do it. And they got into it for the right reason. We like to align with those types of people and help them uh, grow and thrive their business. Excellent. We're out of time. I want uh, to thank our panel for being here. Let's give them all a round of applause. We're very fortunate to have them. Thank you. Well, yeah, sure, one question. All right, thank you for this too. Um, so if I'm trying to reach the return customers, what's the sweet spot of saying, like if I'm gonna send you text blasts or whatever, to, to not bombard them with it. So it's like how many times a week or a month or should I do that? Not to actually turn them off, you know what I'm saying? If you wanna keep them coming back. That's a, that's a great question. I know Lisa can talk a lot about that too. You know, one of the things we do is uh, we look at how often they purchase. Because people purchase at different frequencies. Typically, they, we found most people, I think it's like 80, 70, 80% purchase within every 10 to 30 days. Then it drops off significantly after that. So if you, if you message them too infrequently, then you miss uh, the window of when they want to purchase. And if you're not top of mind, they're going to go somewhere else. So two, two times a week is good, right? Once a week, not enough. Three times, you're, you might be pushing it. What you have to do is look at the unsubscribe rates. If you do it twice, like pick a baseline, do it twice a week, and then try doing it three times a week for a couple weeks and see if that increases your unsubscribes. That's a way to tell if it's too much or not. Also, um, it depends on the relevancy of your message. If someone loves hearing from you, they might be okay with hearing from you every single day. If they don't really like your store or they signed up for whatever reason, they might get one message from you a month and just unsubscribe and not want to hear it again. A lot of it is experimentation. You start somewhere and experiment around that and see how it changes and, and adjust accordingly. And, and to copy what, what he just said, we also look at like end of month data and we're going to look at your unsubscribe rates as well. And just recently, we started sending more messages out for one of our clients because they had really good unsubscribe rates and the open rates were, were starting to increase. So we just felt like we could go from three to four times a week. 
Um, I think we always start off two to three times a week and we kind of measure from there. Uh, we don't want to bombard our customers and overwhelm them, but you want to stay top of mind. And so how, how do you find that? It's looking at the metrics. It's looking at your messages also. Like, are you sending boring, you know, like, here's a new product drop or here's, a, here's a, an offer or a discount? Or are you really, you know, sparking up your, your messages? And we like to, you know, make them fun and exciting and include something that has to do with an experience at the store. Um, there's also other ways that you could do this too. Like you could co-brand with like your dispensary branding with a brand and you could co-partner and co-market with them. And so that's another opportunity to say, hey, we know you like this brand. You've shopped for this brand before and you know, we're, we're featuring them this week or this month or whatever. So I think that there's ways to hit them more than just a, a certain amount of time, you know, like r rather than just saying two times a week, you know, you could, you could kind of look at the holistic overall metrics and see how that works. Did I answer your question?